Well, I'm very thankful to be here this morning. Uh, Brother Lloyd asked me a couple of weeks ago if I would be willing to to preach this morning. And of course, uh, anybody that knows me, I'm always willing to preach. Amen. The <clears throat> was thankful to be able to take a small part in what went on this week yesterday and was encouraged by Brother Tubb and Brother Waller and Brother Monty and several other people yesterday. <clears throat> it's along those lines I want to speak to you today. <clears throat> and they've got a scripture up there for you. It's from, from Mark chapter 14. But before I get into that, I want to talk to you today. Maybe we might call it Christian service. But... You know, we need to uh, remember the fact, because I don't know everybody's in this building today or who might listen by internet later, uh, we need to remember the fact that it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. The title of the sermon this morning is, Have We Done What We Could? But I need to be sure we all understand, and I know the majority of the people in the room do, that our salvation is not dependent upon what we do, and yet our walk with Christ is dependent upon what we do. You know... <clears throat> The first thing, I was blessed today to be able to preach over at the uh, National Guard Armory this morning. And I told those young people there that, you know, it's the first thing you have to understand is that God loves you. You, you have to understand that before you do anything. And because God loves the world, that's what the Bible says in John chapter 3. We could go around the room and, and we could put individuals in there. We could put Luke O'Brien in there. We could put Mia in there. We could put Mason in there. We could put uh, Bruce Waller in there. We could go around the room and put Scott Cantrell in there. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. That if, whew, hope I never get over this, that if you believe, you won't perish. But you'll have everlasting life. We can go around and we can put families in there. The Spots family. The Riley family. We can go around and if I knew everybody's name in the room, we can put your name in there because God loves you. Amen. But in order to grasp that fact, you really have to understand just how wretched we are. Okay? The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all like to build up our own glory, whether we're talking about on the football field or, or in, in life and the toys that we have, the bank accounts that we have, the, the things that we have accomplished in life. And when we compare ourselves with one another, we pick the other guy's weak point and our strong point. But if we compare ourselves to Christ, we have no strong point. For or because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you know, that's the bad news, but the news gets worse, right? The wages of sin is? Yeah. That's right. Death is separation. It's important that a man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. The Bible talks about a second death. That's being eternally separated from God in a place of torment. That's the really, really bad news. Or, or to quote our president, that's very, very, very bad, right? <laughs> Let's get back to the good news. A lot of people say they love you, but he showed it. He went to the cross for you and for me. God commended, he showed, he demonstrated, he manifested his love towards us. And then while we were yet sinners, get a grip on that. That means we were the enemies of God. Yes. You know, the, the verse before that, Bruce says, for a good man, some would dare to die. <laughs> but he died for us as his enemies. Yes. Christ died for us. We go back around the room and put everybody's <laughs> name in that verse. Christ died for Casey. Christ, Christ died for Jason. Christ died for Steve. Christ even died for Chris. Christ died for us. We can understand all of that, sadly, and still go to a devil's hell. I mean, Judas spent three and a half years with him. Come on. And the Bible says he went to his own place. There has to come a time when you, me, whomever, admits that sin and calls on Christ to save us. It's not the words of a prayer. 
I like the way Steve worded that when he was talking about the Lord's Prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer. It would be better termed the model prayer. We don't have to repeat those words, but we include those, those aspects to our prayer. Right, Brother CB? Amen. I have heard people pray some of the things. You'd have to laugh, Brother Spots. It's some of the things I've heard people pray when they're asking God to save them. Because it's not the words of a prayer that saves you. It's the attitude of the heart. Man believes with the heart. And confession is made unto salvation. I heard one guy kneel down and say, Lord, I just need you to come into my life and be the man. I thought, that's kind of silly. But 20 years later, this man has now raised his kids in church. He served God with his life. I heard a young man, probably about Jacob's age, kneel down and say, Lord, I know you said let there be light. I know it was you that knelt and formed Adam out of the dust of the earth. I know it was you that made him sinless, and yet he sinned, and so death passed upon all men. And I know you sent your only begotten son to be born of a virgin, to live a perfect and sinless life, to die a perfect death, and to get up on that third and appointed day and prove that he was God. And I know he's coming back one day. And I know if you don't save me, I can't go with him. I need you to forgive me of my sin and come into my life. 20 years later, as far as I know, he's still serving Christ. It's not the words. It's the attitude of the heart. But for those of you who are here, and probably the majority, I want to talk to you about your service. We're talking about maybe the three R's of the Christian walk, we might say. You call it what you want to. But the, the verses they have here beside me, if you want to look it up, it's in uh, Mark chapter 14. It's also recorded in Luke and it's recorded in Matthew. You know the story well. Jesus is sitting at supper and an old wild woman that's got saved comes in and she breaks an alabaster box and there's arguments over what could be done with this money. It's a year's wage. What could have been done with this money? And Jesus said, uh, before the verse that we have up here, Jesus said, let her alone. Why trouble ye her? And in our verse, she hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. The question for us today, those of us who have been saved, is have we done what we could? Brother Scott uh, preached in, or taught in Sunday school about Asa. Asa is a great character in the scripture. And for 36 years of his life, Brother Scott wrote out, he followed Christ. And then he chose to go a different way. And it's one of my favorite verses when he's in trouble. It's one of my favorite verses, and I very seldom quote it all. <clears throat> it, the brother doesn't have it, so he can't put it up there. But I felt led to include this. They, they, the, the Bible says the, word, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to prove himself strong on the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward you. That's the beginning of the verse. I'll tell you the end in a second. There was a time in Asa's life when he went out with half a million against a million and God gave the victory. But later in life, instead of trusting God, you see, that, that right after the Bible tells us how many he went against, the Bible says he prayed, Lord, you, you alone can give the victory. That's not the exact words of Scripture, but whether it's the mighty or the few, the powerful or the weak, you alone give the victory, and we're trusting in you. And God gave the victory, the next verse says. Amen. But then later in life, instead of calling on God and trusting God to give him the victory, he calls on man to help him. At the end of that verse, you see, God wants to use Steve. God wants to use Chris. God wants to use Bruce. God wants to use Marty. Go around the room. Put your name in there. He wants to use you. His eyes are running to and fro throughout the whole earth to prove himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards you. But at the end of that verse, it's so sad to me, and it's so commonplace. Herein thou hast done foolishly. Basically, we fail to trust him. If you look in Matthew chapter 25, we're not, for the sake of time, we're not going to read the whole chapter or even part. We're just going to read one verse. There's a, there's a parable, but let me catch you up with what's going on there. 
<clears throat> there's a parable there. And Jesus is talking about the judgment. Okay? He's talking about the judgment. And he says <clears throat> that he gave that it's like a man that's traveling and he gives to one fellow five talents and to another fellow two talents and to another fellow one talent. And the five made it ten, and the two made it four, and the one didn't do anything with it. He says to the guy that made it ten and the guy that made it four, verse 21, or whatever verse is up there, I can't read that. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask you a hard question, and I'm going to put you on the spot. Stand up if you do not want to hear the Lord tell you that. Of course, no one stood up. We all want to hear the Lord say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I, I, I think every one of us, if you'll go ahead and take it to the next one, please, <clears throat> I believe every one of us is, is asking ourselves some questions right now. I'm thankful, and I know you are, that this church has a pastor who can say to us, like the Apostle Paul said to the church of Corinth, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Amen. Okay? But the fact is, I should be able to say that to my children with a life that makes it believable. <clears throat> the fact is, ladies and gentlemen, we should all be able to say that to our co-workers. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ, with lives that make it believable. The fact is, men, you should be able to say it to your hunting buddies, your fishing buddies, your golfing buddies, whatever it is you do in your free time, you should be able to say to them, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. The fact is, ladies, your Manny Petty friends, your PTA friends, whatever friends you have, you should be able to say to them, like our pastor can say to us, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Young people, you should be able to say to your classmates, your teammates, your bus friends, your, your bandmates, whatever. I mean, you followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. As far as I know, the only person in this room that knew my daddy is sitting right over there, Mike Rodney. Amen. <laughs> my daddy's been dead 22 years and change. I say all the time, Brother Spots, that my dad was the godliest man I've ever known. Here's why, Bruce. Because if we were fishing on Friday night or at church on Sunday morning, he was the same guy. If he hit his thumb at work with a hammer on Monday, he was the same guy. If he was using a nail gun and that nail hit a knot and turned outside and hit that knuckle and, and filleted that, thumb, that finger right up the side there, he was the same guy. If he was toting OSB and the wind got away from it and nearly ripped his ear off, Brother Scott, he was the same guy. You know, hey, my mama's human. If mama was fussing at daddy, he was the same guy. I never heard my dad raise his voice to my mother. He could say to me, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. But I should be able to say that to my children. You, here's the question we're all asking ourselves right now. You ready? How? How? Because, I mean, I know me. And you know you. I, I can understand how God can use Brother Lloyd. I can understand how God could use my father. But I know John Stuart Hallman real stinking well. I know the temper he has. I know the inconsistencies in his life. But he wants to use me. He wants to use you. He's no respecter of persons. He wants to use you. So how can we, we want to hear? Christ said of this, this old, you know, we would, oh, y'all say you won't. 
But we all look at these people and go, oh, man, look at her. Look at him. That's what they were saying to Christ, right? When this old wild woman that got saved came in there, if he was really the prophet, he'd know what kind of woman that was. He wouldn't let her wash his feet. Now, they might not have said it in redneck, but they would have said it. <laughs> and we do that same thing, right? Amen. The Bible says it's very unwise, but we do it. Let, let, me, let me tell you, I'm glad you asked. Y'all ask such great questions. How are we going to do that? Turn to Hebrews chapter 10. It's a very familiar portion of Scripture to you. It's a very familiar portion of Scripture. Most of the time, we only read verse 25. And honestly, we typically change it. 25, y'all probably heard me say this before. It is a, it's a dependent clause. It doesn't stand alone. And we typically take that, that gerund there, forsaking, and we make it a, a command for sake. But the, the command actually starts back in verse 23. It says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. You know, <clears throat> the, it's the fruit of the Spirit, right? It's not the fruits of the Spirit. But grapes are called the fruit of the vine, right? So the fruit of the Spirit has multiple things there. Love, joy, peace, temperance, etc., right? Temperance, that's holding fast our profession. Fat, holding something fast. That's a term that we used in the Marine Corps, make that fast. My daddy used it when we were hauling hay. M my kids never met my dad. I wish they could see how many bales of hay he could stack on one pickup and get it to stay put with one rope. It was just amazing to me how he could stack it so the bales would hold the bales in place. And he tied that one rope over there twice and put a slip knot in it. It ain't going nowhere. We get there, one pull is free. We unload it, put it in the barn. It's just amazing to me. He can make it fast. When he's talking about holding fast the profession of our faith, it's being consistent, not being somebody different when we're money under there trying to paint around all them nails. We're being consistent. Brother Tubb, I don't know where he's sitting. I can't see there he is. When we're bush hogging around all these stumps and stuff. Not being somebody different at church than we are someplace else. That's holding fast our profession. Do we do that so we can say, well, we're as good as Brother Jason. We're as good as Brother Steve. No. Look at the rest of that verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for or because he's faithful that promised. I love Marine Corps motto, Semper Fidelis, always faithful. I sign my letters now, striving to stay Semper Fi for my Savior. He was faithful, so I should be faithful. He was faithful, so we should be faithful. Amen. Where the rubber meets the road, he was faithful, so you should be faithful. Amen. Go to the next verse. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Provoking is when Brian Benson says, Brother John, you know better than that. <laughs> Provoking is when you tell somebody what they don't want to hear. It actually takes a lot of guts and love to walk up to a brother or sister and say, you're wrong and you know you're wrong. We want to emphasize all that love, but if we have love and we don't have the good works, it's really just a false religion. It, there's another group of people that want to emphasize all the good works and all these signs and show things that I'm a Christian, but if I don't love people, it's just another false religion. Amen. Jesus loved his enemies. Come on, what did he pray when they were running him down on the cross? If you're God, why don't you save yourself? If you're God, you get yourself down and get me down too. They both started out doing that. What did he pray while they were doing that? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Love and good works. Love and good works. Hmm. Look at that next verse there. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. So much the more. So much the more. What's exhorting? I'm from Mississippi. Y'all talk to me when I'm preaching. What's exhorting? What does that mean? 
Lifting somebody up. Somebody over here said, come here, Luke. You sitting down front, you're in trouble. <laughs> I get CJ, but he's all the way back there in the back. So provoking is when I say to Luke or Luke says to me, you know you're wrong. Exhorting is when we come alongside and we help. And it takes both. It takes both. If we're going to do, if we're going to do what we could, if Jesus is going to say to us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. If he's going to say to the saints or to Satan or whomever, he's done what he could. He's done what he could. And we have to, it's a, it's a team effort to serve the Lord. And sometimes it takes provoking. I mean, you play sports, sometimes you've got to tell somebody they messed up. And sometimes you go, oh, come on, man, you did your best. Let's go on. It's a team thing. Here, here's my question to you, which I think I'm going to answer with the three R's we talked about. How do we know when to provoke? How do we know how to love? How do we know how to do the good works? How do we know how and when to lift somebody up? Y'all ask such great questions. Thank you. Point number one. All that was introduction. Now we get into a sermon. Amen. <laughs> Point number one. We must regularly... Read God's Word. How do I know how to clean my life up or help somebody else clean their life up? Psalm 119.9 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. How can I heed it, Marty, if I don't read it? Right? We got to read God's Word. We can't wait. Now, I know some of y'all are like myself. When we fat enough, we could go from Sunday to Sunday without a meal <laughs> but we're not going to do it and we shouldn't do it spiritually we must regularly read God's word how do I keep from sinning I mean how do I keep from messing up Psalm 19 thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee hmm. I, Brother Scott talked about decisions this morning and he talked about I'm going to use the word silly ways that a lot of people today use to make decisions. We try to build ourselves up. We look at our horoscope. Uh, uh, we, uh, we ask everybody their opinion, what we should do. I mean, it's all sorts of things that we do. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path, which is what he brought out in Sunday school. We gotta use the Lord. So if we're gonna if we're gonna get to a place where we can hear God say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Where we can hear Mason, God say to somebody of us, he's done what he could. She's done what he could. We've got to be in the Word. We've got to read the Word regularly. The next, the next thing that, that we have to do, if we're going to if we're going to hear that, I moved my marker, so I've got to flip back here and find it, but it's also there in, in Matthew 25. And I could read you a long portion, and I'm going to read you a good little portion here. Again, he's talking about the judgment. Verse 34, the Bible says, Then shall the king, it's capitalized, it's talking about God, say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? Or when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily, I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. We must remember to do righteous works. Remember to do righteous works. 
A lot of times we sit around in church and we talk about what everybody else is doing that we're not doing. But if we're not doing, we're probably not going to hear he has done what he could. Well, we've got to remember to do right. To, now, a lot of y'all were doing it. I saw scores of people out here yesterday, and I understand there were even more the days before. Well, Brother Tubbs said when we were on the way out to the middle of nowhere, to bush hog and pain. We don't just have to do this three days a year. We can do this anytime we see somebody. Yeah. Amen. Now I believe that the Lord will show you when to do it and when, how to do it and so forth. It's a cliche, Bruce. It really is. It's a cliche. It's trite. We use it all the time. But it's still very true. They need to know how much you care before they care how much you know. We, if we're going to hear, well done, now good and faithful servant, we've got to read the word of God regularly. And we have got to remember to do righteous works. Remember to do righteous works. Third point, coming in for a landing. We must remember to be a reliable and ready witness. A reliable and ready witness. What do you mean reliable? Maybe we should use the word revealed and reliable. What does that mean? No secret service Christians, right? I only talk to other believers. Oh, I see Mason. I know he goes to Meadowood. No. No. There's this fella I know. This goes to the consistency, but it also goes to the witness. There's this fella I know. He, he used to be buck wild. Used to be buck wild. And a friend he ran with when he was buck wild had a, a bad ATV accident. And nearly, nearly, nearly died. He was drinking when he had the accident going to sit around at the house and, and just drink another beer. The only reason he went to the doctor is because his daughter said, please, Daddy, I'm worried there's something bad wrong. And he got there, Brother Spots, and he, his internal organs, because it hit him when it rolled over on him, it hit him between his ribs and his pelvis. And it had crushed some of his internal organs there, and he was about to bleed out sitting there in his living room. This fellow that knew him, went down to Meridian, Mississippi to see him in the hospital. He begins to tell him. He called him by his full name. And he told him, the Lord's got something special for you or you'd be dead right now. He wants to make a difference in your life. And that fellow's wife looked up at the man that had driven to Meridian and said, this one thing I know, it sure has made a difference in you. That's why I say a revealed witness. There's a couplet in Scripture, Scott, word and deed. Word and deed. And our lives need to back up our words. We're commanded in Matthew 28. I believe he's got the Scriptures up there for you. In Matthew 28, it says, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. That, that power is his authority. Okay, so if they don't believe or, or follow after what I say, I, there's no need for me to be offended. They're rejecting Christ, not me. It's his authority, not John's, praise God. Go teach all nations. In Mark, it says take the gospel to every creature. That's every person. In, in Luke, it talks about preaching repentance and remission of sin. You say, I'm a girl, I can't preach. You say, God didn't call me, I can't preach. If you're breathing and saved this morning, he called you to speak. Amen. And I've never met anybody who wasn't trying to preach to me about something. Preaching in its basic form. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> preaching in its basic form is explaining and urging people to comply. Somebody might be explaining why I should be an old Miss fan. Somebody might be explaining why I need to be a Roll Tide fan. I mean, you were born in Tuscaloosa and you're not a Roll Tide fan. What is wrong with you? Well, me and my money went to Mississippi State, so I kind of feel obligated, amen? 
Why I need to vote Democrat? Why I need to vote Republican? Why Trump's good? Why Trump's bad? Right? Everybody's trying to convince us of something. But if you've got Jesus Christ living in your soul, you need to be explaining to people Amen. repentance and remission of sins in his name. Amen. Repentance, a change of mind that brings about a change of direction. And John, he said, as the Father sent me, even so send I you. Now, I love y'all, but I don't see anybody in here who's born of a virgin. I don't see anybody. I know it's close to perfection right back yonder behind Jennifer, a couple of pews is my wife, and that's close to perfection. But I don't see anybody that's sinless. But when Jesus looked at sinners, he saw them as sheep having no shepherd. <laughs> that's a whole sermon in itself, and I better not go there, but sheep are stupid. And if they're not used to you, you're not going to give them anything. They've got to see your walk every day. And you've got to love them. See, it's passion. Acts, the emphasis is kind of on the place, but then there's also, before we get to Acts 1-8, which you could probably all quote, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. Before that, there's 10 days in prayer. I call that the preface to the Great Commission. Pray. And then in his power, his authority, his power, that unction of the Holy Spirit, his passion, his love, take the gospel to every person of every people in every place. He said, I'm just not a speaker. Great, you know, for little and nothing. You can get some little tracks right here. In fact, I probably got 20 of these in my pocket and it's got your church name, address, pastor's name, phone number on the back of it. First 20 people come up here, I'll give you one. You can give that to somebody. It's not hard. You don't have to have a PhD in theology to tell somebody about Jesus. Michael, I've never had somebody argue with me when I said, I'm just thankful that somebody told me I was a sinner on the road to hell and I came to know him as my Savior. Just giving you testimony. Listen, if we're going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, if we're going to hear the Lord say to us or anybody else, he, she's done what they could, we've got to read the Word of God regularly. We've got to remember to do righteous works. And we've got to be a ready, revealed, reliable witness. So we'll go back to the verse we started with. She's done what she could. Have you done what you could? I'm coming in for a landing. I promise Jason is on the way up here right now. Here's the question. Or it's more of a statement. If you're here this morning and you don't know for 100% that you got a home in heaven, you come up here when he starts singing and let me or one of these other brothers and sisters take a Bible and show you how to be saved. But for those of us who are saved, the Holy Spirit's telling you right now that you are or that you are failing to do what you could for Him. And I encourage you to make the right decision in your seat. But I'm going to tell you, Miss Spots, it's been very few times I've done that. If I don't come forward, I don't seem to actually commit myself to what I've just told the Lord I'll do. But you don't have to do that to suit me, neighbor. Just do what the Lord tells you to do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the privilege.